What a week it's been. The S&P 500 is back in bear market territory after the Fed's FOMC monetary policy came out, and we don't know if it is done falling yet. It may be done. It may have dropped down to support uh, close to these low levels that the S&P 500 hit in July, but we don't have confirmation of that yet. We could see a little bit more selling on Friday heading into the weekend, uh, or we could see a little bit of a support bounce here. There are a couple of reasons to think that we may get a bit of a support bounce here, but there really are two levels that we're gonna be watching in the next couple of weeks. The current support level that we are at, and then the lows that the S&P 500 put in in the middle of June, somewhere down here around 3650 on the S&P 500. So what happened? Well, let's take a look at the Fed. They uh, raised interest rates by another 75 basis points. And as part of their statement, they said that the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook. So that's pretty standard fare. They're going to be watching to see what else could be impacting inflation. Earlier in the statement, they talked a lot about Russia and the impact that the Russian war in Ukraine is having on inflationary pressures and in global growth. So we're starting to see uh, inflationary pressures picking up and global growth slowing down. So that's a combination that nobody likes to see. And so the Fed's watching that in addition to everything that they are watching here domestically. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. But they also said the committee would be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy if appropriate, as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. So the committee's goals are to get inflation back down toward 2%. And so if they start to see more issues out there that could be pushing inflation higher, they have said that they are willing to be even more aggressive than they have currently been. So they raised interest rates, uh, 75 basis points, and they've got two more Fed meetings uh, coming up this year. And right now we can see that uh, traders are already pricing in that after having three straight meetings with 75 basis point rate hikes, that we are going to get a fourth 75 basis point rate hike in November. So the next meeting is in November and the market is currently pricing in nearly a 70% chance that the Fed is going to raise rates from its new target range of 3% to 3.25% up to 375 to 4%. So that would be four rate hikes in a row of 75 basis points. Now, as we go out to the December meeting, the expectations are that the Fed will slow things down just a little bit, that they're not going to raise by another 75 basis points, but that they will be raising by 50 basis points at the December meeting, which would take them up to a range of 4.25 to 4.5%. So uh, traders are pricing in the expectation that the Fed is going to be rather aggressive. Now, we just got released the new futures contracts that go into the second half of 2023. And so this CME FedWatch tool is now tracking those futures contracts. Uh, previously, we were only able to see what was going to be happening about halfway through uh, 2023. Now we've got a, a look out to the end of 2023 and what is being priced in, this is the dividing line here, is that the Fed is going to have rates still at 4.5% by the end of 2023. <clears throat> so we're getting about a 60% chance, uh, maybe just a little bit more than a 60% chance being priced in that we are going to see rates at about 4.5% by the end of 2023. Now the market is coming by these numbers honestly because the Fed also released their updated economic projections with their monetary policy statement. They do this every other FOMC meeting. So this was the meeting that we got at the last time we had uh, gotten these economic projections was in June. And we can see how the Fed's outlook for the U.S. economy has changed in just a couple of months from when they met in June to when they met this week. And uh, when we look at these numbers, you, we've got these year columns and whatever the number is listed here is telling us where the Fed thinks things are going to be by the end of the calendar year that is in the uh, column. So for example, change in GDP. Uh, they thought that GDP growth was going to be 1.7% here in the United States during 2022. They now think GDP growth is only going to be 0.2% for this year. Next year, they lowered 
their expectations from 1.7 to 1.2. So they think the U.S. economy is going to slow down, and they know why it's going to slow down, because they're raising interest rates so quickly. They also think that a slowdown in the economy is going to boost the unemployment rate. Uh, for the uh, next year, they have estimated that unemployment will be at 4.4%, which is half a percent higher than they thought it was going to be uh, in June when they provided their expectations. And then the reason that they are being so aggressive with their monetary policy is they anticipate that inflation is going to be rising. They think headline inflation is going to still uh, be increasing by 2.8%, which was higher than their June projection. And their core inflation projection is higher by 3.1%. So you notice that the headline inflation number didn't go up by quite as much because energy prices are coming down. Uh, we saw a big drop in natural gas today and oil prices have continued their steady march lower, which should have a positive impact on the headline inflation number. However, this core inflation number is uh, 0.4 percentage points higher than their June estimate. And they think that core inflation is going to be the big problem that they're going to have to try and solve here with their monetary policy. So they do think that inflation is going to continue rising into 2023. So this tells us that the Fed knows that they're going to be raising interest rates and they have changed their own expectations for where they think the federal funds rate is going to be by the end of the year. They actually have pegged it at 4.6%. So if we look at these two charts together, the Fed is actually pegging their own estimates that by the end of 2023, that the federal, federal funds rate is going to be here between 4.5 and 4.75. That's why they labeled it as 4.6. It's right in between 4.5% and 4.75%. Uh, so they, they usually try and peg it to the middle of the target range that they are looking at. So while the market is still thinking there's a chance that uh, the Fed will have rates down here below 4.5%, somewhere in the range of 4.25 to 4.5 by the end of 2023, the Fed itself has it pegged a little bit higher. So the market is coming by these numbers naturally and anticipating that interest rates are going to be much higher for much longer and that the Fed is going to have to be relatively aggressive in raising interest rates. So as the market has been adjusting to these new expectations, they have been doing a lot of different things. The first thing that they've been doing is selling off stocks. Uh, that's because the uh, estimates for the future value of the revenue and earnings that companies are going to be generating have been lowered because uh, the discount rate has been moving higher as treasury yields have been moving up. We can see that the yield on the 10-year treasury this week, it was bouncing right below resistance here last week. The high that uh, the TNX had reached previously in the middle of June was about 3.5%. And uh, so last week, before, uh, as we were heading into this week with the Fed's meeting, uh, the yield on the 10-year Treasury was hitting this resistance rate. But so far this week, it's been uh, moving higher. And today, it shot up above 3.7%. So 4% for the yield on the 10-year treasury is not that far off. And as we approach 4% on the 10-year treasury, that is increasing the discount rate that traders are applying to companies' future earnings. And anytime we increase the discount rate, it means that we're going to be reducing the amount that we think that those earnings are going to be worth in the future. And so traders aren't willing to pay as much for those companies. Uh, stocks because they don't think their earnings are going to be worth quite as much in the future uh, compared to what uh, they could get if they made an investment in U.S. Treasuries. With the 10-year here at 3.7, the two-year jumped to 4.11, and even the 30-year is up at 3.6. Now, what you'll notice here is that we have a full inversion now of the yield curve. Not with the federal funds rate yet, but if we get up to 4.5% by the end of the year, uh, 4.5 would be above the two-year treasury. And then as we go down that yield curve, uh, we have a full inversion with the 10-year treasury now being higher than the 30-year treasury. There was a while there where we had an inversion in the middle of the yield curve because the 10-year treasury was low, but the 30-year treasury had gone higher. Now with the 10-year treasury moving higher than the 30-year, 
We have a full inversion of the yield curve, which tells us that the bond market is anticipating that we could see the US economy dipping into a recession in 2023. So the market's trying to adjust to all of this and it's had an impact on stock prices. If we look at the heat map of the S&P 500, it wasn't all bright red today like it was yesterday. We did have some patches of green. You can see healthcare stocks are still doing well and uh, Microsoft was able to buck the trend today. So was Alphabet and uh, Meta, uh, but most of the rest of the market uh, we saw a fairly substantial declines here. Uh, you can see in technology, especially semiconductor stocks, they are feeling the brunt of this. And the financial sector also got hit with uh, this inversion in the yield curve that's going to eat into their net interest margin, the money that they are able to generate. And so uh, traders are anticipating that their profits are probably going to be a little bit lower as well. Now, the Fed's not the only central bank that is raising interest rates, and that's one of the reasons why traders are starting to worry more and more about a potential global sell-off. If we look at the calendar of events here, you can see that uh, today the uh, Bank of England also raised rates uh, up to 2.25%. So uh, the Bank of England is raising rates. This European Central Bank has been raising rates. The Bank of Japan's kind of been out on its own. They've been trying to uh, salvage uh, things in Japan because they've got uh, a whole different set of issues that they are dealing with, uh, with trying to keep economic growth alive in Japan. But uh, with most of the major central banks around the world raising rates, that is going to uh, put the brakes on global economic growth and uh, that is going to be felt not only uh, here in the United States but elsewhere and so it's one of the reasons why we are seeing those declines. Now tomorrow we are going to get some additional data with the uh, flash manufacturing and flash services PMI. This is the purchasing managers index. This is going to tell us what companies are preparing for in the future. The purchasing managers are in charge of making sure that the companies have all of the materials that they are going to need to be able to fulfill services and product orders in the future. And so we are seeing, uh, we will see tomorrow what these frontline purchasing managers think about the future for the economy. Are they going to have to purchase a lot because they think demand is going to be high or are they going to be cutting back on purchases because they think demand is going to be low? And uh, we'll see more what uh, corporate America is thinking about uh, the uh, possibility of a recession here in the United States in 2023. And it's all that talk about potential recessions being brought on by these high interest rates that is sending the S&P 500 back down into bear market territory and why we have to be concerned about these support levels that were established in June and July and see if the S&P 500 can hold at these levels. So, so far today, the S&P 500 held at the support level that was established by the S&P 500 while it was consolidating here in this uh, bullish flag continuation pattern. Uh, while uh, everybody was trying to decide, should the stock market come out of bear market territory? So we're back down in bear market territory. We're holding so far. We'll see if we can get a bounce tomorrow. Now, the reason why I think there's a possibility we could see this support level hold and get a little bit of a bounce, again, we're not thinking, oh great, we're going to get a support bounce here and we're going to suddenly find ourselves in a bull market, but establishing support is going to be the first step for the market is we are seeing the VIX still at a relatively low level. Now, uh, it seems weird to say that it's at a relatively low level, although it has risen so much during the past month and a half. But if we zoom out here a little bit on the VIX and even just look at where the VIX has been during 2022, we're nowhere close to these previous peaks. Uh, in fact, we hit resistance at 30 yesterday after the news came out. Uh, that the Fed was going to be more aggressive with its monetary policy, and it has since pulled back from those levels. Now, it's still elevated, and we're going to have to watch this for a little bit. But um, the fact that it hasn't climbed back up here to 35 or to 38 or to 40 is a positive sign for us. So we're going to be watching that. We're also going to be watching this relationship between the VIX and the three month VIX. I'm gonna change this to a line chart. It's a little easier to see. Uh, you can see that when the ratio or the uh, relationship between the 30 day VIX and the three month VIX 
rises up above one that tells us that traders are acutely concerned that uh, we could see uh, a an imminent pullback but even with everything that has happened this week the close for this comparison chart has always stayed below one we haven't reached those uh, panic moments like we did here in May or like we did here in February and March or like we did at the end of last year the, we haven't seen traders piling into the VIX so much that it has pushed the value of the VIX higher than the three-month VIX. That's a good sign for us. Uh, now, again, is it a, a bullish sign telling us that the market is going to be recovering and starting to move higher immediately? No, uh, but it is telling us that we have an opportunity uh, to have a market that hasn't yet reached panic mode to potentially put in some support. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, are seeing here is that the number of stocks in the S&P 500 that are trading above their 200-day uh, moving average, that percentage has dropped down to just below 18%. So we're nearing the lows that we saw this summer as well. And when we get down to these low, low levels, oftentimes we will see traders coming back into the market and thinking, okay, maybe we have the potential to buy stocks at a value here. Uh, we always hear Warren Buffett talking about buying at the point of maximum fear because that's when you're going to get the best deals on stocks. We're probably going to start to see some value buying coming back into the market as we drop down to these lower levels that have previously held as support. The fact that they held as support this past summer is encouraging as we approach those levels again that they have the possibility of holding as support once more for us. Now, if the economic data continues to get worse and worse and worse, then uh, we may not uh, have as uh, much hope for that. But as we look out into next week, uh, we're going to get a lot of important economic data here uh, for uh, durable goods purchasing. We're going to get consumer confidence numbers next week. And uh, we're going to get the final GDP for Q2. Nobody's really going to be caring too much about that number unless it comes in way different than uh, it came in previously. But then uh, next Friday, we're also going to get this core PCE price index. So it was the core CPI or consumer price index that got everybody nervous here and has caused the Fed to be more aggressive. We'll see if the PCE price index is as bad as the CPI was, or maybe it comes in a little bit better. This is the Fed's preferred in, uh, inflation indicator. And so we'll see what type of confirmation we get from this uh, next week. So that's going to be important. What uh, we're also going to learn is with pending home sales and new home sales, uh, with the TNX moving up as high as it has, it has been pushing the yield on the 30-year mortgage rate up higher and higher. And today, uh, it came in at 6.29%. And if you look at where this uh, rate for the 30-year mortgage is and come back, you can see it wasn't it hasn't been this high since the financial crisis. And really through most of the period between the recession that came after 9-11, which is highlighted here with this gray bar, and then the recession that came with the financial crisis, for most of that time in between there, we saw the 30-year mortgage rate hovering right around this level. So we haven't seen mortgage rates up uh, this high for a long time because the Fed has had interest rates near zero or at zero for uh, a lot of the time between uh, the financial crisis and now. So we're moving back up into more of a normal range where we had been, you know, we haven't been there for the past decade, but uh, we're getting up to these levels and it's probably going to continue to slow down the housing market. We're seeing uh, price declines in the housing market. We're seeing a lot of the stocks that are related to the housing market, whether they are home builders or whether they are retailers that benefit from the housing market, like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or furniture companies. Uh, all of these stocks now are feeling some pressure, but uh, if the Fed continues to raise rates, we'll probably see the yield or the rate on the 30-year mortgage continue to inch up a little bit higher. I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit some resistance up here where it uh, previously had. You know, back here, we were talking about 6.7%. So we're still below this 7% line, but we're probably going to see some increases, especially if the yield on the 10-year treasury 
does continue to climb up toward 4%. So uh, traders are uh, accounting for that risk premium that's going to be built into 30-year treasuries. It is having an impact on the housing market, which is one of the major uh, drivers of economic growth here in the United States. So we're going to have to be watching uh, for that very, uh, very closely. Uh, one other thing to touch on here is uh, the value of the U.S. dollar uh, just continues to move up to new highs. And uh, this is even with the Bank of England and the European Central Bank and other central banks raising rates. The Fed is raising rates faster. And so uh, treasuries in the United States are still more attractive than government bonds in Europe or in Asia or other places. And so investors are continuing to move money from overseas into U.S. treasuries, which requires them to uh, exchange whatever currency they have for U.S. dollars because treasuries have to be purchased in U.S. dollars and we're seeing demand for the dollar going higher. And as that demand goes higher, it's pushing the value of the dollar higher and that is uh, going to hurt the top line revenue numbers for a lot of multinational firms. Uh, technology stocks are particularly vulnerable to this and that's <clears throat> one of the reasons why we are seeing semiconductors and other technology stocks getting hit so hard is not just because their uh, forward uh, earnings and revenues are being discounted at a higher rate, but because the revenues they're generating aren't going to count for as much in dollar terms when those revenues are repatriated from overseas. And in technology, about half, well, about half of the S&P 500's uh, revenue is generated overseas. Uh, for the technology sector, it's even more than half of their revenue is typically generated overseas. So that's one of the reasons why we are seeing some downside pressure being applied there. So there is a lot going on, a lot that the market is having to adjust to these new expectations uh, based on uh, what we saw here from the Fed's expectations. And the market is pretty in line now with where the Fed uh, says they think things are going to be going in terms of GDP growth, in terms of unemployment, and in terms of where the Fed is anticipating uh, it's going to see the federal funds rate by the end of 2023, which is in a range between 4.5% and 4.75%. So now that they've made those big adjustments to these new expectations, there's an opportunity or a chance that we could see some support start to show up here in the S&P 500. We're gonna to have to wait and see that confirmed, but there's a chance uh, that we could see that. So we'll keep monitoring it here in uh, these videos that we're doing here on YouTube and keep you posted on what we see coming next.